Okay, hello everybody and welcome to my talk. I think I wasted already a couple of seconds with getting the mic fixed, so I will try to keep the introduction a bit short. Today I'm going to talk about what we are going to do in the terms of the Delta project when we go beyond the, Delta, uh, beyond the elemental crystal set which we have looked at up to now. And for that I will start on a relatively bit general level. Um, so if we do our density functional theory calculations, there are actually quite a lot of sources of errors which we can encounter. May, probably the most severe one would be that we completely uh, misrepresent our, oh, sorry, yeah, closer, um, that we completely misrepresent our system, which means that we calculate a surface facet which the experimentalists do not actually observe or that we do calculations in a period, uh, completely periodic cell while usually would, you would have only one molecule absorbed on the surface. The second source of error um, would, oh, that, what was the wrong button? Uh, the second source of error would be, yeah, God. Um, that we use the wrong level of theory, which means that we instead of using appropriate method like GW for excited state properties, we would just do our ground state DFT calculations. And the uh, error sources which I'm actually really concerned about in my talk are the numerical errors, which might be due to different implementation details. I hope those are relatively small, but we will see. <laughs> um, as you have already heard from Stefan and Kurt uh, in more detail, there was this huge effort of our community to quantify uh, precision in density functional theory by the means of the Delta project. And the message was that um, basically we get a, everything is fine except for the very old methods, which are you can see over there in red. Um, one point to make here is that the, the values which you encounter for the very old ultra soft pseudo uh, for the very old non-conserving pseudopotentials uh, are about 14 milli electron volts, which will be also an order of magnitude, which we meet again later. But let's have a look what we are currently planning to do beyond the elemental crystal data set. Uh, yeah, this is the, first of all, the first thing which you could do beyond the elemental crystals would be to study crystals of different crystal structures like FCC, BCC, diamond or simple cubic structures because most of the elemental crystals they have varying structure types and here we could in a more systematic way study how, uh, how the crystal structure influences the delta values. The one which I'm concerned with would be the next step where you instead of elemental crystals you, uh, look into binary materials because of course the if you have only elemental crystals, then first of all, by symmetry, all bond types would be nonpolar. Or if you combine only elements of the same systems, the hybridization of the orbitals of those elements uh, will not lead to any kinds of shifts in the energy of those orbitals. Uh, for this, we have designed a test set of binary oxides, which represent formal oxidation states from plus one to plus six. How those look like, we will uh, see in a minute. Uh, then the next step, which is actually uh, Thomas' work, who will give the talk directly after me, that's uh, where you look into different bond types. Basically, he will handpick a couple of uh, binary materials from a large database, which are experimentally realizable, and they uh, and calculate delta values for those materials. As I mentioned already, I have been concerned with this oxide test set. And basically, we looked, uh, we wanted to find six different oxide structures, which are simple, which means they are cubic and don't have any further internal degrees of freedom. Um, most of these structures do not even actually exist in experiment. I mean, especially the most weird ones like the XO3 structure at the bottom right. Uh, the point here, however, is not to actually look into experimentally available uh, binaries, but instead to vary our chemical environment in a systematic way. So basically what we want to have is a simulation of different chemical environments for which this oxide um, should be a good test set, which we will see later. As I mentioned earlier already, the real existing experimental oxides will be part of Thomas' work. And since I'm 
doing uh, a lot of calculations for this six different uh, oxide structures for all of the uh, I think I did in total all of the 95 elements for which I have pseudopotentials in VASP. Um, I, will, I ended up with something like 35,000 uh, calcula individual calculations, which is at least what I wrote in my computing time proposal. And if you want to do something like that, you need some kind of an automatic framework um, which will help you doing the calculations automatically, doing the data analysis automatically, and make it easy to share your data with all of the other collaborators around the world. One example of such a framework would be AIDA, which you will probably hear more about in another session tomorrow. But of course, there are others, like yesterday I had a discussion with um, Jörg Neugebauer for the Pi Iron and so on. So I just wanted to mention this one because I'm somehow involved in the development of the VASP plugin of AIDA, and that's why I feel obliged to make some advertisement here. Uh, so let's have a look at what would be the results. So first of all, I am comparing right now the uh, deltas for the two different PAW sets which are available in VASP, which are basically the VASP standard PAW potentials and those labeled as the GW ready potentials. And the ba um, this is basically as a first test because my job was to get all the structures relaxed and then later when somebody else does the all electron calculations, which is also Thomas' job, um, he will, we will have some final delta values. So for now, the first uh, graph which is shown here are the deltas for the elemental crystal, set, uh, elemental crystal test set comparing the two VASP uh, PAW sets. And as you can see, um, the results are, don't have that high delta. So the maximum delta which we can get here is around four which is not that bad. The average delta of, the, uh, of those two pseudopotentials would be something around one milli electron volt, which is not too bad. But as you can already guess from the amount of space which I have left here, if we look at my oxide crystals, we will have a slightly different picture. So what is shown here for, to keep this figure not too overcrowded, just the average value of all of the six oxide structures. And what we can see that for most elements, actually the delta value is not that bad compared to the elemental crystals. However, close to the noble gas configurations, you usually see somehow spikes in the delta of the oxide test sets. Um, in particular, around here, xenon, barium, cesium, those are the elements where the delta values can get really large. And we were looking into what might be the reason for that. So first of all, here's some statistics, most of the deltas as if um, how many deltas I can find among my structures and most of the deltas from the oxide test sets are in the range from 10, from 10 to the power minus 1 to 10 to the power 1 where the largest examples this would be xenon here and then barium and cesium are there <laughs> and um, the main reason for this is which was to us some kind of a surprise is that the two vast PAW potentials give a very different equilibrium volume for some of the crystals in our test set. So as you can see here from the scatter plot, which plots the delta versus the equilibrium volume difference between the two pseudopotentials, that for structures which have a delta larger than five, already our equilibrium volume um, may differ by more than 4%, which is in terms of our uh, procedure to calculate the deltas, already a bit concerning because usually when we calculate deltas we will scan the volume plus minus six percent of the equilibrium volume so in particular the really bad cases where we have ten percent and more which is xenon here barium cesium um, we are really a bit out of the place where the equation of states is, uh, is fitted correctly uh, in particular we will look at one case more in detail now which is barium O3 because for barium, we get for every of the six oxide structures a relatively high delta with barium O3, the most uh, uh, problematic candidate, and also with, which has one of the largest differences in the equilibrium volume. And just as a reminder for the audience, the main difference between the two D, uh, PAW data sets of, the, of VASPs uh, is that the GW ready potentials include a number of additional unoccupied orbitals to improve the scattering properties of those potentials. 
And these actually show up in the density of states, which I have plotted here for an elemental barium crystal for the um, barium O3 projected onto the barium orbitals and for the standard potential and the GW potential down here. And as you can see, uh, the, or probably if I would have plotted here the F orbitals also, I mean the, the, red cur uh, the curve in red are the four F states of barium. Uh, for the GW potential, those four F states become occupied and uh, contribute to the binding, while in the elemental crystal they don't show up. Actually, the unoccupied barium peak is at plus nine electron volt or something like that. And this is uh, actually a message which might be interesting for the for pseudopotential developers because the main reason why the uh, standard potential doesn't show any kind of F states is that the VASP BAWs inc uh, include the or, F, or do include F projectors only if you have some kind of F state somewhere, which means that if you don't take into account unoccupied F orbitals, there won't be any F projectors in the pseudopotentials. Yeah, and, but we are not actually dealing with the four, or F orbitals of barium here, but instead, um, because that would be also the wrong way of charge transfer, because actually we are transferring charge away from barium to oxygen. Uh, what we are actually looking at is a different uh, way of how the hybrid orbitals bonding between the oxygen and barium are formed. And for this reason, we plotted the charge density difference between the calculations with the standard potential and the GW potential. And what you can see here is around the oxygen atom, in yellow is the charge density contribution when there is more with the standard potential. So with the standard potential, we will, the charge is localized around the oxygen um, atom. And then when we look at the GW potential, we actually see here the formation of some kind of a binding orbital. This then explains why the uh, volume difference between the two pseudopotentials is this large. We actually, um, we didn't observe this effect in other oxides. So here's one of the arbitrarily chosen uh, oxides with the low delta value, which is the conium oxide. And that one doesn't have these contributions around the oxygen. We actually confirmed that for, uh, all, for all elements with a delta larger than five, there is the addition of new projectors in the pseudopotentials in the GW data set. And the behavior of this bonding orbitals, which you can find here, is also always uh, the same. We compared this also to the all electron results already. Stefan did some calculations for the most problematic cases. And from that, we can see that usually the GW potential agrees uh, quite well with the all electron calculations, which means despite of these uh, um, two pseudopotentials being very similar, the uh, GW potential performs better in this kind of exotic cases for our oxides, which is um, also quite good news. So just to keep it a bit uh, short, we then tried to, oh, now I completely switched off the monitor, which is great. Uh, we looked into if there are any kind of correlations between the deltas we obtained from the elemental test set with respect to the deltas from the oxide test set. And as you can see here from the scattering plot, if we just plot the bare data, there's not much of a correlation visible. But in the end, um, as Kurt already mentioned, we are dealing in all of these cases with uh, some amount of outliers. And actually, when we checked for outliers, which means that some of the oxide structures don't behave as all of the other oxide structures, we could identify most of the XO3 structures, um, which are the, the red dots here, as outliers. And after, after we cut them, uh, and we take into account the very problematic elements like xenon or barium, and we also take those out, then with some amount of fantasy, you could actually plot a, try to draw a line through there and claim that there is a correlation between the deltas from the elemental test set, uh, elemental crystal set and the oxide test set. And this is basically the main conclusion which we have up to now that the, first of all, our definition of delta is somehow transferable to a more exotic electronic uh, envi uh, chemical environments like this oxide test set. 
And second, that the oxide test set is relatively, is more sensitive to even really subtle uh, differences in pseudopotentials like those in between the two vast PAW sets. And with respect to the time, I'm now out of time, which means I will just throw my conclusions here. I skipped some part of the talk and thank you for your attention. <laughs> yep.